Hebrews chapter number 9, going through our Bible study verse by verse, Hebrews chapter number 9 for the night. Just a review of the previous chapter, Hebrews chapter number 8, of course, was dealing with the two covenants. And it was referring to the fact and teaching that the new covenant... The, the New Testament is a greater covenant or greater testament than the Old Covenant or the First Testament it's also referred to as. The covenant of grace is a better and greater covenant than the covenant of the law. That was pretty much what uh, Hebrews chapter number 8 dealt with. It's a very simple summary. Now prior to that, of course, we learned all different types of things about living in the New Testament and all the benefits that we get of uh, all the different things that are better for us and greater for us today. And, uh, you know, obviously we know that Jesus is better than the angels. That's one of the very first things that we learn. It talks about how Jesus is better than man. That's one of the things that we learn in chapter number two. It goes on and talks about how Jesus is a greater or, or better high priest. It talks about him being, you know, better than just uh, the, you know, the Levites in general. And then we got into Hebrews chapter number eight and it started tying it together. And if you look at Hebrews chapter number eight, he says in verse number one, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So in the previous chapters, all the way to chapter number seven, you know, he was building up. And then he got to chapter number eight, and he's really going to give you a conclusion. That's what a sum means, like a summary or a conclusion, you know, the sum of a, an, some sort of equation, a mathematical equation. It means, that, you know, he's giving you the conclusion of the things that he had spoken previously. And he concludes it by just comparing the entire testament or comparing the entire covenant. Obviously, all of those things, the high priest, all the, they're attached to a covenant. So the summary is, hey, let's just talk about the covenant in general, the whole entire testament, and the New Testament is a better testament. That was his point in Hebrews chapter number 8. He also explained how, in uh, Hebrews chapter number 8 that is, he also explained how the Old Testament has been done away with. How the old covenant has been done away with. That's where we ended in verse number 13. It said this, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. And then he says this, very important. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So he's explaining that that old covenant, it's at this point, you know, something that's old. What does something that's old do? Well, it decays and then it's, ready, it's just ready to vanish away. That's his point. You know, it's, it's just going to be gone. His whole point is that, hey, it's not in place anymore. You know, you, we can uh, learn this in multiple different uh, places, multiple books in the New Testament. The Old Covenant is done away with, right? He doesn't regard it anymore. You know, there are major changes that are made in, uh, you know, the New Testament time period, New Testament scriptures. And here in uh, Hebrews chapter number 9, we're still going to deal with the covenants. That's what we're going to, and he's going to be speaking kind of more broadly just about the covenant, and he's going to be jumping everywhere. So that's one of the things I wanted to point out to you. Hebrews chapter number 1 to number 7. He kind of jumps around and each chapter really has its own point that he's speaking about and something about maybe Jesus being better, better than the angels, better than the sons of God, or the, uh, the sons of men, right? Humans, right? He's better than man. You know, better, he's a better priest. Then he summarizes it with the covenants. And now in Hebrews chapter number 9, he's kind of just going to be going all over the place. It's still really a part of the, of the uh, summary of why just the new covenant as a whole is better than the old covenant. The new covenant is better. So he's still comparing the covenants. Look at Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 1. It says this, Then verily the first covenant, excuse me, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So there it's talking about the first covenant. That's the law. That was what was given to Moses. And of that there were ordinances that were of divine service. Now what does that mean? Ordinances that were of divine service. Now ordinances... Uh, you know, obviously comes from the word order, right? And, and uh, you know, different uh, uh, sects or different uh, families of the Levites had different jobs to do within the temple and within the tabernacle. And they would be referred to as, as, you know, their order. They would be called their order. You know, Kohath has an order. You know, all of them have their order. This is their jobs. This is specifically referring to their ministries. And uh, when it says ordinances of divine service, it's saying that God is the one that gave all of these ordinances. God is the one that gave all of these different rituals that they would do, right? These are practices. That is another word for ordinances in this sense. It's a practice or it's a ritual. And everything that went on within the first uh, tabernacle was ordained by God. That's the point. So we can learn from it. He's telling you that because we're getting ready to learn from some of the things that they did uh, in the tabernacle under the first covenant. Look at verse 8. 
It says this, speaking of something that they you know, would do and practice within the, the old uh, uh, tabernacle, under the old covenant, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Now the point I wanted to uh, focus on there was the Holy Ghost, this signifying. So notice that, that this was divine. All the practices, all of the instruments, everything that was in the tabernacle itself was all ordained by God. It was divine. So we learn from those things. And it was a worldly sanctuary. That's referring to the earthly sanctuary. It was a sanctuary that's on earth as opposed to the sanctuary that is, that is in heaven. Uh, one thing that's interesting about the book of Hebrews is it always talks about the sanctuary. It always talks about the tabernacle. Let me word it that way. It always talks about the tabernacle and it doesn't talk about the temple throughout the book of Hebrews. That's because God ordained and, 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 and His will was for there to be a tabernacle. You know, it was in David's heart to build a temple, a permanent house. But God ordained that there would be a tabernacle. So when God writes scripture in the New Testament, he's not going to refer to the temple. He refers to the tabernacles because that's what he said. He is the one that ordained and that was originally what was in his heart. Now, yes, God, you know, uh, worked with David and gave uh, instructions on how to transition into the temple. And, and they did do that. But... God originally, His original plan and His original will was to have the tabernacle. And that makes perfect sense why He would refer to the tabernacle all throughout the book of Hebrews. So go on to verse number 2. It says this, For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So we're going to read verse 3 and then we're going to deal with verse 2. It says, And after the second veil... The tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Now I want you to notice there that he actually refers to both sections as a tabernacle. Brother Rick pointed this out to me, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago. And I had never noticed it before. You know, uh, both sections are actually referred to as a tabernacle. One is referred to as the first tabernacle and the other is referred to as the second tabernacle. Notice that the second, there's the second veil and it says the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Of all. Now that, of course, is where the Ark of the Covenant is located. We'll deal with that in just a moment. So back up to verse number 2. It says, For there was a tabernacle made the first. So this is the first tabernacle, right? And they were erected entirely separate. You know, they built the other tabernacle inside of that one, basically, because it had its own walls and uh, uh, as far as the, the veil that went up and, 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 and all of that. So it was, it was distinct. It was partitioned. It was put up afterwards. So they built the, the first tabernacle with its own walls, right? And then inside of there, it's like building another room, if you will. And they built a second, and the Bible refers to it as a second tabernacle. It's actually called that here in just a moment. But it tells you what's in that first tabernacle, and it says, Wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, and then it says this, which is called the sanctuary. So that area specifically was called the sanctuary. That area was called the sanctuary. Oftentimes people refer to like this as the sanctuary, right? You know, we don't normally do that here. We'll just call it like the congregational area. That's what I'll do myself. But this is where all the people would congregate. This is where everyone would come. Everyone's allowed here. This is where people would come, you know, when they had an offering that they were going to give and things like that. Anyone was allowed in this area. But that not everyone was allowed to go into the second veil or into the second tabernacle. Now, we're told a couple of things that are here. And the Bible is extremely deep. You know, there's, there's layers of, of, of truth. There's layers of even symbolism. There's so much symbolism that you can pull out of this. But notice it tells you the things that are in the tabernacle. And you can look these up. They're all extremely consistent with the Old Testament. It says, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So you look at some of these things like a candlestick. Now, everything ultimately points back to, to, to two things. And these two things are basically the same thing. The Word of God and Jesus. And Jesus is the Word of God in the flesh. So when you study things out, you know, it may feel repetitive, and that's because it is when you're study, studying out symbolism in the Bible. Now, what is the, you know, what is, a, 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 what is the function or the purpose of a candlestick? You know, before we had electrical lighting, people used candlesticks for what? I mean, the purpose is to, to bring light so that you can have light. Now, what, you know, over and over again, what is the Bible referred to as? David refers to it as a light, right? 
it is, it is a light unto us, right? It's a, it's a, you know, God's, God's Word, God's law is a light unto our path. It's a light unto the way that we walk, the way that we live our life. It gives us light, you know, in darkness. We don't understand that. It enlightens us. It teaches us. Light represents knowledge in the Bible. This is knowledge. This is understanding. This is wisdom. So the candlestick, of course, is rep uh, representative of the Word of God. Of course, it represents the Word of God. What does, sh what does the showbread represent? Well, the Word of God, or the bread is oftentimes, you know, likened unto uh, the Word of God as well. You know, Jesus said when he was quoting the Old Testament, when the devil, Satan, came to tempt him in Matthew chapter 4, he said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, then in the book of John, again, he's relating, you know, the, the word of God unto manna, right? You know, he says that he is the bread of life. And what is he? He is the word made flesh. In the beginning was the word. So all of the things are going to point you back to the word. And you know what else they're going to point you back to? Jesus. Who, what is the light in Revelation? Jesus. The Bible tells us that there's no need of the sun or of the moon. Why? Because the Lamb is the light thereof. So you know what the candlestick is? It's the Word of God. Do you know what else it is? Jesus. Amen. Do you know what the bread is? It's the Word of God. You need to eat it every day, right? It, it keeps you humble. You've got to get down on your knees and, and, and get it. That's how the children of Israel had to get it. Do you know what else it is? It's Jesus. So all of the, the symbolism oftentimes will, will take you back to the same place. And that's why I mentioned that there's layers of symbolism. Do you know another point of the candlestick is this, a really good point? Is this, what's the purpose of a candlestick? To give light. In uh, Revelation chapter number 2 and 3, he speaks about, we see the candlesticks that are around Jesus, and he speaks to all the churches. And what does he talk about? That he's going to do what? He's going to take their candlestick away. And what does that candlestick do? It's basically recognizing them as a legitimate church. So it kind of symbolizes the church itself. And once that's gone, you're no longer a church, right? It's the Spirit of God, but it, it's a church that, that God recognizes, right? It's a legitimate church. It's the house of God. If He takes that away, you're no longer a legitimate church. You know what the candlestick represents is the church. Because you know what a church is supposed to be? A light. It's supposed to be a light to the world. You know, uh, you know, just like Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter number 5, you know, that uh, you know, uh, uh, you, when you have a candlestick, you, you, know, you don't set it in a corner. I can't remember exactly how it words it, but you put it to where everybody can see it. Right? You don't hide it under a bushel, right? You know, uh, you take it out. You know, uh, it needs to be set on a hill. You know, you need the things that we learn and know in here, we don't need to just keep it here. You know, we shouldn't just try to keep all of the, be in a cult, you know, type of system where we don't want anybody to know this precious knowledge that we have and it's just, you know, something that we, it just makes us so much greater if we have it and just, we need to minimize it and all of these secret handshakes in order to let people, you know, back into the, the, the second tabernacle, you know, which can be my office, I guess. You know, I didn't mean anything blasphemous by that, but, you know, that's, that's not good. Any knowledge that we have, we need to want and try to share that with people. If you learn something new in the Bible, why don't you come tell us about it? If you've been studying your Bible and you notice something cool, come tell me because I'm interested. If we have you know, uh, some, some good knowledge, let's go share it with the world. Let's be a light. You know, we, we here are meant to be a candlestick. We're meant to be a light on a hill. And we should, you know, shine that light as far as we can and let as many people know, you know, about Jesus Christ and the Bible and all this knowledge that we have. We should bring them the gospel. What's the greatest light of all? The greatest, you know, enlightenment is when you understand the gospel. That's the greatest enlightenment that exists. Yeah. So you know what we should do? We should take that candlestick and walk it around in Jacksonville. So and let everybody receive the light and let the whole city of Jacksonville, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes cities are just filled with sin. You know, they're just extremely sinful places, right? They're just, you know, just a uh, uh, higher the population, the more people get together because people are sinners, the more that sin abounds. You know, that's just a fact. And... You know, Jacksonville is a wicked place, just like all these other big cities are. Why don't we shine the light? Let's bring the gospel to them, and then let's bring them in, and we can teach them the Bible and get them out of that darkness. Amen. So that's another thing that you can learn from the candlestick. There's so many different things, but the, you know, the table, the showbread, layers and layers. Uh, so, but there's surface meanings as well. These are all literal instruments and literal you know, uh, uh, furniture and all of that that they had set up. Look at verse number 3. And after the second veil... The tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Verse number 4. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna 
and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Now, so here in the holiest of all, we're told the instruments that were in there. Number one, there was the golden censer. You know, they had certain fragrances and, and mixtures of perfume and things like that that they were supposed to burn. They weren't supposed to, you know, to mix these things. They were supposed to be specific to what God wanted it to be. God is a God of order and He wants things to be exactly the way that He wants them. He's a God of details as well. It's another a good point that we can learn from that. But He says, And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Of course, the golden pot that had manna. What is manna? It's the Word of God. Points us back to the Word of God. Points us back to Jesus. We have Aaron's rod that budded, and we have you know the tables of the covenant. I mean, that is the Word of God. There. That's another point that plays on with uh, uh, Sunday evening sermon on the Old Testament covenant. Notice what it says, the tables of the covenant. I didn't even bring that up, but that's another good point. It just shows over and over again these truths in the Bible, how the author you know, is being divinely inspired. You can see these, all these truths just popping out. So notice it's the tables of the covenant. Verse 5, And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So uh, he says, so over the Ark of the Covenant is what that means. All of those uh, uh, items that were listed in verse 4 were inside the Ark of the Covenant. So now he's saying over top of the Ark of the Covenant. And verse 5, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. Now what does the Ark of the Covenant represent? The presence of God, right? The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And it's shadowing the mercy seat. I want you to notice that it's shadowing the mercy seat. Now, I believe this is at the end of chapter number 4. Yeah, chapter number 4, verse number 16 says this. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is talking about the fact in the New Testament with Jesus as our high priest, how we can pray to Jesus who is in heaven. And now he's the mediator between God and man while we're on earth. We can pray to him and he will answer our prayers. And it refers to that throne while in heaven as the throne of grace. And then he, he shows you that grace and mercy are interchangeable. Those words. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So notice there, just like how on the earth when they built the tabernacle and it was supposed to be the figures of the true which was in heaven, he refers to right there where the Ark of the Covenant was and above it, you know, the, the, what was built was the mercy seat. And what was that? That was a picture of what was in heaven which was the literal throne of God. Now I want you to notice too, this is important, how many thrones are there? How many thrones are, 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 are listed in Hebrews chapter number 9? How many thrones were... were, were Within the cherubims. One. What was this supposed to be a figure of? The true. So if, if that is our basis on, of, of what's on earth representing what's in heaven, what's the, what is that indicative of how many thrones are in heaven? What does it imply, at least, that there would be one throne in heaven? I want you to notice in chapter number uh, uh, 4, as I read verse number 16, it's saying that we are approaching this throne of grace or approaching this throne of mercy. And I want you to notice if we look closely at verse number 15, who is on this throne of grace? Who is on this throne of mercy? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, boldly unto the throne of grace. Saying, because he can understand. So we should be able to come boldly to his throne because he, Christ, can understand because he has understood this. So notice there's one throne and notice who's on the throne. Christ is on the throne. Amen. I want you to look back at Hebrews chapter number 9. The last part it says this, And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. And then he says this little statement, Of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now particularly I think he just means like, the Bible uses the word expressly in 1 Timothy 4. It just means like specifically. It means like explicitly. He's saying I can't speak to you about this in details or particularly or specifically because I think he's referring to the fact that at this time it, it wasn't available. Because we know that they didn't have the, all of the, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't have that at this point. That wasn't available for them. So he wasn't able to go to it and see it and look at it. So that's what I think he's referring to. We cannot speak particularly because he's not able to you know, get the details of all of it. Look at verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. 
But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So I want you to notice that everybody, there was only one person that was allowed to go into the second tabernacle. Did you notice that it said this? Now when these things were thus ordained, verse 6, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. So notice that the sanctuary area is referred to as the first tabernacle. What does that make the other area? The second tabernacle. And it says that in verse 7, but into the second, that means second tabernacle, went the high priest alone. So only the high priest, also known as the chief priest, was allowed to go into the second tabernacle. Right? And it says that he only went in once a year. Go to Leviticus chapter number 16. He only went in once a year, and it says not without blood. So saying when he went in, he wasn't allowed to go in without blood. That's referring to the blood of, of goats and of calves. It says, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So Leviticus chapter 16 verse 5 is where this is actually recorded and the instructions are given on how this is supposed to go about. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 5 says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And it says, And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and so forth and so forth. And then one of them is the scapegoat and then the other one, they kill it and they take in that blood. So notice that first he offers a, a, uh, a sacrifice for himself, an offering for himself. Just like uh, Hebrews chapter number 9 verse number 7 mentions. But then he goes in with the uh, uh, atonement offering after they let the scapegoat go, the one that they're going to be offering for the atonement for all the people, he brings that in second. That's what that's referring to. It says, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. That's actually not just, you know, uh, from one particular offering. That's from two. And then it says this in verse 8. The Holy Ghost this signifying saying that the Holy Ghost by this was signifying or signing. Now if you look up the word signifying, it's only used a few times and it's every time when Jesus is explaining about his resurrection and his death and all of that and it says that you know he spake this signifying what death he should die. And then he also, it's also worded about, so it's worded about his death I think two maybe three times. And then it's worded one time about Peter's death. When it talks about how, you know, you know when you're old, you know, somebody's going to take you where you would not, you know, and, and all of that. I can't remember exactly how it's worded. And, uh, you know, it's basically saying that he's going to glorify. This spake he concerning the death that he should die, you know, glorifying God. Something along those lines. So those are the only three or four times that the word signifying is used. And it's always re referring to words. And that's what I believe that this is referring to because the Holy Ghost, when we read the Old Testament, that's the Holy Ghost signifying something. And then when we see it all laid out, exactly how it's supposed to be, that's God's Word, you know, in the, in the flesh and physical, if you will, in the physical. You know, it's erected, it's built exactly to the dimensions. So, whether it be on God's Word or whether you look at it literally, if it's exact and God looks at it and says that's exactly it, the Holy Ghost through that is signifying, it's teaching you something. What does that mean, signifying? It means it's symbolizing. You're learning something from it. It's a sign. That's what a symbol is. It's a sign and you can look at it and you can learn something from it. Whether it's God's Word perfectly now. A lot of the, a lot of the, uh, 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 word, the word of God, a lot of the revelations when they came to men and they wrote them down, they wrote down the Word of God, they came through visions. So it would be the same thing as if they, it came through a vision, you know, the temple or the tabernacle, and actually Moses was, a, was permitted to see what was in heaven and he said build it to that pattern. And then, you know, he took that, he wrote it down, and he built it. They're the exact same thing, because it was built to the exact same specs, and God was pleased with it. It was exactly the same thing. So you could, it signifies it through Scripture, and it signified it through uh, uh, what was built, you know, the physical building. So what, what is it referring to? It's referring to that only the high priest was able to go into that area. Only the high priest was able to go into that second uh, um, tabernacle. It's explaining verse 8. That's what that means, I'm sorry, verse 7. That's what that means in verse 8 when it says, the Holy Ghost this signifying. So it's saying, the Holy Ghost was signifying, now it's going to tell us, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So it's saying that 
what that was supposed to symbolize or what that was supposed to signify, the way that it was built and the fact that there was a partition there and only one person could go into the mercy seat, only one person could go into the presence of God, that the way to get to God was not yet made manifest. The way that you could get into the presence of God, you know, let's say this, the way that you could get to heaven, right, was not yet made manifest. Now, does that mean that they didn't know anything about it? Does that mean that they didn't maybe have some details? No, of course not. What it's saying is that it was not clear. That's what that means. I'm going to show you that. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. <clears throat> How confused were the disciples about the Messiah's job and the Messiah's task? Extremely. But let me ask you this. Were they still trusting the Messiah? Were they still trusting God to save them? Yeah. Of course. Right? That doesn't mean all salvation is different because, you know, the way to get there wasn't perfectly made manifest. They still knew that the Messiah was coming to save them. They still knew that God was coming to save them. But they didn't fully understand every detail and how and which, you know, the way into the holiest of all, you know, was, uh, was to be brought about. The way to get to God was to be brought about. I want you to look at this with me in 1 Peter chapter number 1. Look at verse number 8. Whom having not seen, talking about God, or Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, <clears throat> yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now watch this in verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, I want, this is a verse oftentimes the dispensationalists will try to use on you, but it's actually, you can actually cause it to, the, the verse actually teaches the opposite. You can learn from it the opposite of what they think it's teaching. So they'll say, see, they didn't know how to get to heaven. You know, the prophets, they didn't even know what they were writing, right? The prophets didn't even understand, you know, how the grace was going to be brought to you. But I want you to look at it one more time. Look at verse number 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, I want, you, I want to ask you something. Can you inquire and search diligently for something that you know nothing about? Is that possible? You know, if, if you didn't even know that something existed, it's not possible to ask for it. If I had a bag of M&Ms in my pocket, or if I possessed M&Ms, let's just say that I possessed you know, M&Ms, none of the kids would ask me for it. But the only way that they could ask me for it is, they, is, if, they, is if they knew that I had it. Then they could say, hey, where's the M&Ms? Right? They may not know where it's at. They may not know all the details. But let's just say that I had candy. Right? The same uh, uh, logic applies. They would still have to know that there's candy. They would still have to, in order to come ask me for it, in order to ask me details about it, well, how, you know, what are you going to do with the candy? Where's the candy at? What kind of candy is it? They would have to know what? That there's candy, right? So this verse actually teaches the opposite. We can learn from this that the prophets did know that there was salvation coming and they did know about the grace, they just didn't understand about it. They didn't understand every detail and it says that they inquired diligently. They asked diligently about it. So they kept seek, seeking and searching for it, but they didn't understand every single aspect about it. That's why it says in verse 11, searching what or what manner of, of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So they didn't understand every single aspect of it. it and then it tells us in verse 12, uh, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you uh, with the Holy Ghost sent down from, from heaven the things the angels desire to look into. So now what's preached unto us are the details that they wanted. That's what that means. They knew about the salvation. They knew about the grace that was going to come. They searched and inquired diligently, but it wasn't revealed unto them. All the details weren't revealed, but do you know how they were saved? By Jesus Christ. By the, the same way that anyone saved, by faith, by grace through faith. So go back to Hebrews chapter number 9. So what that was symbolizing was that it wasn't revealed yet. We were waiting for the Christ to come and all the aspects weren't revealed. You know what the, actually what the veil represents? 
is Christ's flesh. When Christ dies on the cross, do you remember what happens? The veil is torn in half. The veil is ripped in half. You know what that represented? That now we can go in to the holiest of all. You know what they didn't understand? You know what all the disciples misunderstood? That exactly. That he had to die. Peter's rebuking him. He, they knew he was the Messiah and they were trusting him and believing in him to save him. But you know what they didn't get? They didn't understand and it wasn't revealed unto them yet that the way that he was going to save them was by dying on a cross. It wasn't going to be just through just coming and conquering everyone, you know, as it seems that some of them were confused about. You know, he's going to be the Christ, the Messiah, he's going to be the, you know, the Prince of Peace, he's going to be a ruler, the government's going to be on his shoulders. So they're confused about all these different prophecies about, you know, the millennial kingdom, he's going to be reigning and ruling and he's going to be conquering and, and you know, he's going to, he's going to uh, you know, bruise the... Uh, 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 the, the serpent's going to bruise his heel and he's going to bruise the serpent's head. So they're confused about these prophecies and they didn't understand the, one, the, the major detail of how he was going to save them was by dying on the cross. And that's actually what the veil represented. The veil actually represented Christ's flesh. That's what it represented and that's what it was signifying that it wasn't yet made manifest. And that's the particular aspect or, or characteristic that they misunderstood. Isn't that interesting? That what that was, what that, that tells you, hey, that wasn't yet made manifest. And then when, what do we not see made manifest to all the disciples? That's the one thing that they really struggle understanding. So it makes perfect sense. Now, I love how you can compare the stories and then statements. And then they line up, you know, perfectly, just like that. Look at, and that was, it says at the end, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Look at verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, that's complete, right, as pertaining to the conscience. So this is not talking right now specifically about salvation. It's talking about the conscience and saying that it could never make him perfect uh, uh, as pertaining to the conscience. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now, that verse is specifically referring to the things that were in the tabernacle. Uh, so that is important to understand, not to take it out of context. There are other verses that explain to us that there are changes in the New Testament with, you know, the Sabbath day and, and, and recognizing and acknowledging the Sabbath day that that is no longer, you know, for the New Testament. We're told that there are certain things that we don't have to, that we're not required uh, to follow as far as the dietary restrictions, the dietary laws. Elsewhere. Peter was told that. We can learn that stuff from elsewhere. But verse number 10 is specifically talking about the ordinances of the tabernacle. Because it says this, one more time, referring to the first tabernacle, which, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. And then it says, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances. These were the ordinances of the temple, the things that they were required to do in the temple. And it says, imposed on them until the time of reformation, right? That's the, the, the reformation of the covenant. When the old covenant passes away, the new covenant is now put into place. Uh, verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesse, uh, have one of them give me some water. That is to say, not of this building. This is referring to the, he's, he's the, uh, the high priest of the tabernacle in heaven, the true tabernacle. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, before I start picking these verses apart, as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, I want to uh, 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 you know, remind you that, remember, chapters 1 through 7 was dealing with individual topics on how Jesus is better here, how Jesus is better here, how he's a better high priest, how he's a better... Give me my water and get out of here, being a ham. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's dealing with all these specific topics. But then here, now that he already told you about the high priest, now that he told you about the offerings, how he's, be he's a better sacrifice. I forgot to mention that earlier. He's a better priest. Now he's talking about the whole covenant as a whole and everything that it consists of and how the whole thing in every way is better. He's tying it all together all at the same time. <clears throat> 
And that's what he, he, he was saying in verse number 11. But Christ being coming high priest of good things to come. By a greater and more, ta uh, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And then he says this, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He's talking about the holy place in heaven. He's talking about the altar. He's talking about the mercy seat. All of that in heaven. The, the, the true. Saying that he didn't enter into the worldly one, and he didn't go into uh, you know, the, the tabernacle that he went into within the veil with the blood of, uh, I'm sorry, with the blood of bulls and of calves. He took his own blood in there, and this is the true. He's saying in every way this is better. Notice how he's building all these points. He's tying it all together at once. And then he says this, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So notice that he's stressing that now this one's eternal. Remember the, the chapter number 8, one of the major differences between the Old Covenant and New Covenant? That the new covenant gives, it's e the new covenant is eternal. It offers eternal life. It's an eternal covenant that will never pass away. Notice how all of this is being tied together all in one verse. Look at verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. So it's saying, so if that's able to sanctify or purify the flesh, if that's able to sanctify or, or, or purify on a worldly, in a worldly sense or in a fleshly sense, verse four, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I want you to notice there that it says, shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, this is a good point to prove to people that, you know, people will say, oh, you guys are modalists. The Spirit of God left him, and then it's just a man that died on the cross. This is a good point to actually prove that that's false. That's not what we believe. We don't believe that he was just, it's just a man that died on the cross. That's foolishness and stupidity. It's a false accusation. We believe that God died on the cross. Amen. We believe that a righteous, you know, a righteous God in human flesh is who died on the cross for Amen. the sins of the whole world. Notice, who it said, notice uh, what it says about how he offered himself. How much more shall the blood of Christ who threw what? The eternal spirit who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Notice that when he died, what was there? The eternal spirit. Right. Obviously, because he's God. He's not anyone else. He's not this other person. He's not this mesh of people, right? It's God in the flesh. God, it's that simple, my friend. There's one God, there's one person, and he was manifest in the flesh. He put on flesh. He came in human form. It's that simple. It's that easy. It talks about the soul of God. Well, the soul of God put on human flesh. And that's who died on the cross. God as a man. It's that simple. There was no changes. Nothing took place. God as a man died on the cross. And then, of course, his body remained on the cross. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights. That's what the Bible teaches. It also makes a, 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 a reference to uh, the blood of bulls and of calves. Notice it says, the eternal spot offered himself. And it says, without spot to God. Remember, uh, the, in the Old Testament, they had to pick out a, uh, you know, a, a bull or a calf, a lamb, ram, whatever it was. It had to be without spot. So that's a reference to him offering it without spot. This is a good verse you might read over. It might go over your head, but you know what that's teaching? He's sinless. That's what it's teaching. It's teaching that he had never sinned. He's sinless. He's without sin. He was with, when he died on the cross, he was without spot. Amen. He was without spot. He had no blemishes. He had no faults. He had no flaws. He'd never made a mistake. In his entire life. He was 100% sinless. Isn't that an amazing thought? <clears throat> it is an amazing, incredible thought. A perfect, 100% perfect man died on that cross. That's what the Bible teaches. It says he was without spot to God. It said, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So he's saying if that was able to do something for your conscience to, to you know, uh, motivate you or prod you or encourage you to do something to serve God, how much more should the blood of Christ who offered himself through the eternal spirit without spot purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. How much more knowing that God himself died for you on the cross and he offered himself you know, as a sinless lamb for you? That should motivate you to do some work. That's what that's saying. That should motivate you to stop spending your time on dead works. And then you could, you could uh, uh, you know, broaden this sense. Obviously, this means something specific, but you could broaden that. There are so many other dead works. It's just a waste of, of all the waste of times you know, that we spend daily, all the time. 
You know, that should, that should motivate you. You know, if that's what you need to do, reflect upon that. It'll motivate you to do more works for God. It'll motivate you to do more for God. That should purge or clean your conscience and say, hey, you know what? I'm not doing enough for God. I should do more for God. I'm not serving God with all of my capability. Look what he did for me. And out of a grateful heart, you should do more for God. Knowing what he did for you and that he was perfect and that he didn't deserve it and he died for you anyways and he loved you enough to go through with that, that should purge your conscience from dead works, from vanity, from, you know, just, just, you know, uh, uh, waste of time to serve the living and true God. Amen. Look at verse 15. And for this cause, so because he offered himself, because he died on the cross, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. What's a mediator? It's a, it's a middleman. The Bible uses the word daysman one time, and that's referring to a, it's a mediator. It's a man that goes in between two people. It's in the book of Job. Right? A me, God, you know, Jesus Christ is a mediator because he was God as a man. You know, in order to bring back and to reconcile that relationship, we need somebody there in the middle to fill that gap. So you know what God did? God took on flesh and he filled the gap himself. Right? You know, man cannot become God. So you know what God did? He became man and he filled the gap. <clears throat> Excuse me. He filled the gap. And it tells you because he died, it says, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means, that means there means like way or ways, if you will. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Notice that this is an eternal inheritance under this covenant. And he, what he had to do was, in order to get that other covenant totally and completely out of the way and all of the, the attachments to it and all of the guidelines to it, he had to die on the cross and establish the new covenant. Because he obviously had to, he couldn't just, he wasn't going to just do away with the old covenant and have no covenant. So he died on the cross, paid for all the sins of the old covenant, and now the old covenant's out of the way. Now there's a new covenant that's replacing it. That, that went into its place. And obviously there are errors with what is taught as replacement theology. There are a few errors with it. But all, all in all, the new covenant replaced the old covenant in a major way. Not to say in every single way. Verse 16. For where a testament is, so this is just speaking in generalities. If you have a testament, it's saying, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So it's necessary. It is, it, it, is, it is essential. You must have, in order to have a testament, you must have a testator. Testator is the person, right? That's, referring, that's a noun referring to a person. Uh, and then it says this, For a testament is of force, saying it has power, after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. It's like you think of like about a will, right? It's even called like their last testament, right? So you think about it, it's, it's, you know, in that sense, it's not valid until the person dies, right? And once the person dies, then they get out the will, then they get out their last, te last testament. You, you obviously, you know, I couldn't go in if I had a grandma. I don't have any grandmother, you know, any, any uh, grandmothers living. But I couldn't go in and get their will and just start like, you know, issuing out and distributing out all the possessions. That's not valid yet, right? Because why? Because the, the testator is still alive. The person that wrote the testament, right? So, you know, uh, right here it says, For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither, so in the same way, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, so he had blood of, blood of calves and goats, and he had water, and it says, And scarlet wool. So he had scarlet wool and hyssop. That's a plant. It's like a, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a type of a mint plant. I know it's of the same species, uh, the same gene of, of, of mint <clears throat> as uh, hyssop. It says, and sprinkled both the book. So he dipped that and the wool in the blood and the water and he sprinkled it. Both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So I'll, I'll point out something interesting to you. Maybe do your own study on this later if you want. I want you to notice that when this testament took place, what did he do? He sprinkled what? Two things. Not just one. Two things. Blood and water. Right then he sprinkled blood and water. 
right? The ashes of a heifer, you know, is the, the new co covenant, like, or I'm sorry, the, the once a year. But right here when the, when the testament was implemented or finalized, he took blood and water. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it gives you specific details of something that happened. A man took a spear and shoved it into his side and what came out? Blood and water. You think that's a coincidence? Not a chance. So notice how, how perfect you know, these types of things when you compare even the new, te new covenant and old covenant to one another. So it's saying that if there is a testament, there must of necessity, there has to be a testator. It's saying that Jesus Christ was the testator and he had to die. Now dispensationalists, and I kind of went over this in the Sunday evening service, they'll say, well see, that couldn't have been applied to the people prior to him. I'm going to debunk that by a verse here later in the chapter. We're getting close to the end of the chapter. I'm going to show you that. There's many other ways you can, you can do that. But in this very chapter, that's disproven. Number one, he offered himself through the eternal spirit. It was an eternal sacrifice. It, that's why, you know, it's eternal redemption. And not only that, God's eternal. It's, he's outside of time. God knows the beginning from the end. You know, God, when he died on the cross, it was the eternal spirit. So therefore, it could be applied to anyone throughout any period of time because he's eternal. You know, that's, you can't even compare the two things to one another. It's nonsensical when you try. But not only that, God gave the promise prior and his promise, his word is just as good as done. If God says something, it's going to come to pass no matter what. So God promised that Jesus was going to come in the promise of salvation. He may not have revealed all the details as we talked about, but he promised that it was going to happen. Therefore, he could go ahead and say, hey, my, my death applies to you if you put your faith in me. They put their faith in him. He hasn't died yet. He applied it to him. And what did he do? He offered himself through the eternal spirit. That's why he can give us eternal life. It was, a perfect, it was a, the perfect sacrifice. You know, he, he, he uh, you know, in that sense, you know, it was the eternal spirit that took the punishment and he gives us, it's a perfect substitute, gives us the eternal spirit, he gives us the eternal life. That's what that's talking about. And another point, you know, he offered himself through the eternal spirit, obviously he was the, he was the Holy Ghost in the flesh, that's what he was, because, you know, what did he send? The Holy Ghost and caused Mary to conceive. It was the Holy Ghost in the flesh, God is a spirit, that's why it's the eternal spirit that was offered. Very simple. Then it says this in verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So anything that had to do with that covenant, he sprinkled it. This was a testament to remember. This was a, a, a test. Not, I'm not referring to the testament or the covenant itself. Testament in the sense of, you know, testifying. That's why he did that. It was something of remembrance. That's why people would, would, uh, would build, uh, uh, what would they call it? When they would make a, a covenant between one another, they would build something. What would they call it? A landmark. a landmark or something like that. There's another word I'm looking for, but they would build things like that so that they would remember it. And if somebody said, you're lying, he'd say, well, what about that landmark we put up? That's the point of that. Right? They would offer that as like a token of the covenant. That's why they would do that because it's something that's memorable. You know, he went around and he sprinkled all this to say, hey, this is the testament. Like the song is used in the Old Testament, uh, the song of Moses is used as a testament against you, right? So he sprinkled all this to be a witness, if you will, right? <clears throat> um, and it says, all the vessels of the ministry. And then he says this in verse 22, it's interesting. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Now what I believe that first statement means when it says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, I think that that's talking about if you, if you sin against the law of God in the Old Testament, he's saying in most cases, the way to right that wrong, blood must be spilled. That's what I believe that that's saying. So, when you break the law, the way to purge that sin or to cleanse that sin, blood must be spilled. Very often, adultery, I mean, look at the, the Ten Commandments and how many of those you know, ultimately can lead to the death, you know, uh, uh, death penalty, to capital punishment, right? So that's what I believe that that means. And then it says, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So it's saying in order for you to receive remission, or in order for there to be forgiveness, or for something to be remitted, there has to be blood spilled. That's what it's saying. It's comparing that unto the testament itself. It's like this, for the wages of sin is death. You know, there must be, in order to receive, you know, uh, uh, in order for there to receive forgiveness, if you will, in order to right the wrong, blood has to be spilled. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. That's what you deserve for your sin is death. Right? So what did Jesus do? He died. That's the point. He's tying that in with why did Jesus, why is it necessary that Jesus died on the cross and that he spill his own blood? 
Because without blood, you know, without, uh, without blood, there is no remission of sins. It's necessary that there be a death. He first uses that as a point. And if there's a testament, there must be, there must be a testator. And there has to be a death of that testator in order for that to be uh, consummated or finalized. But furthermore, in order to cleanse the sins that were under the first testament, there must be the shedding of blood. Because in order to receive remission or forgiveness, you have to have, there, ha there must be blood that has spilled. That is where your life is, obviously. You know, the, the Bible teaches that uh, you know, it, within our blood is where the life is. Look at verse number 23 now. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves better sacrifices than these. So notice there's a physical application and a spiritual application. So obviously, um, in the Old Testament they would receive forgiveness from the worldly sanctuary and the worldly sacrifice, they would receive that or fleshly sacrifice and fleshly tabernacle, they would receive forgiveness in the flesh. The temporary relationship that we have with God. They could get their life right with God if they went and they did this work and they had this lamb sacrifice. That would please God and that could get their restore their relationship. But that has nothing to do obviously with spiritual salvation. So there's the physical aspect the physical tabernacle, the physical sacrifice, the physical, you know, uh, uh, all of that sanctuary, but there's the spiritual. In order to gain access into heaven, in order to go through that veil, what do we need? We have to go through Jesus Christ. We need His blood applied to our souls. That's what we need. It's comparing these two things, and it says, It was necessary, therefore, that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, saying, with the blood of Christ. But the heavenly things, oh, I'm sorry, he was talking about the earthly things, but he's saying the pattern of these things. I'm sorry for the confusion. Last part of 23, this is that part about heaven. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the actual heavenly things in, in heaven, right? All the, you know, the altar, the mercy seat, all of that. That has a better sacrifice. That has a better blood on the altar. Right? So it was necessary that that would inquire or require you know, a, a better sacrifice than the sacrifice that was on earth. Verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Saying that he didn't go into the worldly sanctuary. That's the one that was made with hands. Moses, the Levites, they all built that. That was made with hands. God obviously built it in heaven by his word. It says which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So notice that everything on the earth was a figure of the true. So it wasn't the opposite. It wasn't the reverse. There are a lot of people, as I mentioned last week, that preach and teach that what is <clears throat> in heaven is all just symbolic. That there is no real mercy seat. There is no real altar. There is no real tabernacle. There isn't anything like that. But basically, just the veil on the earth just represented Christ's flesh. Now, of course, there is symbolism there. Notice a moment ago that the candlestick represented what? The Word of God and Jesus. So you have multiple layers of, of truths here. We don't disregard, we don't, uh, disregard the, the, the surface meaning, though. The, the, the surface interpretation. The surface interpretation is that the things on the earth were patterns or representatives of the things in heaven. And it says that the things in heaven are the true. So what's in heaven is the true tabernacle. What's in heaven is the true altar. What's in heaven is the true mercy seat. Now if I wanted to really pin somebody down to prove that in heaven there, all these things are literal, I would say this. Look at the Ark of the Covenant. There's a mercy seat, right? Right? Isn't there a mercy seat? Everybody agrees with that? That represents a literal mercy seat or a literal throne in heaven, right? Look around about that. What is there? You have cherubims round about the mercy seat. What do we have in he heaven if we look at Revelation 5? Literal cherubims. Now, this is important because of this. In the, in the Old co Covenant or under the Old Covenant, they had to take a sacrifice in there, didn't they? And they had to literally take that blood and sprinkle that blood. Why did they do that? Why did they... Let me ask you this. Why did a literal lamb have to die? Why did it literally have to die? 
because Jesus literally died. It was, a, it was symbolism of the true. All of that was just symbolism of the true. It's not the opposite, right? The reason why the lamb died was because Jesus was going to literally die. The reason why they took that blood and literally sprinkled the blood on the altar was, is because why? Jesus literally sprinkled blood on an altar. So that on the earth was symbolic. That was the symbol. It's not the other way around. That's not the pattern. That's the pattern. And furthermore, I know we looked at this already. I think it's like Exodus, I have it written right here, Exodus 25. We're not going to go there, but in Exodus 25, he act, it actually tells you that the way in which Moses received the revelation and all the specs and details of how the tabernacle was to be laid out was by seeing a vision of the things that were in heaven. He allowed him to see it. He said, see, or uh, in the Old Testament, he says, look. In the New Testament right there, if we look at the verse, it says, see, when he quotes it. He showed it to him literally, and he literally looked at it, and he, and he said, make, make it according to the pattern that I showed thee in the mount. What was on earth was just meant to represent what's really in heaven. That was the point of it. That's the whole point. And it matters because the blood of Christ matters. And this is why it's a bigger deal than maybe anybody's aware of. The same people that teach this kind of crap are the same people that teach that Jesus' blood isn't that important. I wonder why. I wonder why they want to try to act like the altar really or literally being in heaven isn't that important. Now the Bible's real clear, yeah, Jesus saved us by his death. But the Bible's also real clear that by the blood of Jesus is how we receive forgiveness of sins. And it, it just shows that you don't really understand how covenants work and you don't really understand Hebrews chapter number 9 if you think that it's not important whether he sprinkled that blood on the altar. Do you know what consummated that covenant in the Old Testament? The fact that they sprinkled it and then he said, this is the blood of the covenant that God hath enjoined unto you. Do you know what sealed your fate? As far as being saved and receiving eternal redemption, the same exact thing. Because all that that represented in the Old Testament and under the Old Covenant is what Jesus Christ would do in heaven one day to seal your fate eternally. The, the altar was there and he literally and physically sprinkled the blood on the altar. And now that I can go forward and approach the mercy seat, I believe when we get to heaven we'll be able to go and look at his blood. I think, and I've thought about this, I think that I'll literally be able to walk up to the throne of mercy, the throne of grace, and I can look at his literal blood that was pumping through his veins when he died on that cross, and I can see it. The literal physical blood that saved my soul. Amen. I think we're going to be able to go to it. You know why? It has to be a testament. God is a just God. You know, this, you know, this idea that oh, God could just do whatever he wants. God's a just God. God is perfect. He shows us what, what justice is, and God operates in a just way. Right? Now people will say things like, oh, he could just forgive everybody he wants to. Yeah, but that's not right. He does things the right way. He's a just God. He, do, he does things the just way. Do you know what, why he sprinkled that blood there? That it can be an eternal testament for us. That's why he offered himself to the eternal spirit. While it's talking about what? Blood. Do you know what's inside your blood, the Bible tells you? Life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Do you know what that is when you look at that altar? That's the eternal spirit on that altar. Really? Because inside of your blood is your life, is your spirit. Those two words are used interchangeably. That's your life or your spirit. You're looking at, when you look at the blood on that altar in heaven, you're looking at the spirit of God that died on the cross for you and he went up to heaven and he literally sprinkled it. So this is why it's important. We need to understand that all the things in the Old Covenant and under the Old Testament, that's what's the symbolism. That's what is the, the pictures. And the only reason why that took place was to symbolize the true. The cherubims are there is because there's literal cherubims in heaven. The mercy seat's there because there's a literal throne in heaven, a literal mercy seat in heaven. The altar's there with blood on it because there's literal blood there. That's why it matters. This attitude of, oh, it's all symbolism. These same people are the same people. You know who says this kind of crap? John MacArthur. He teaches that. Do you know those same people teach about the whole book of Revelation? They're all millennial. They, they, oh, it's all poetry. It's all, they, it's all spiritual. None of it's literal. That makes zero sense. You cannot read the book of Revelation like that. You're a total moron if you think that the whole book of Revelation is not literal. It talks about, hey, I showed you things. They're literal things that happened just now. Right? And he says, 
And I'm going to show you other things, literal things, just like the things I just showed you, actual events that really took place two seconds ago, and then I'm going to show you th actual things that are going to take place here in just a few, you know, uh, or in, in a couple thousand years, or whenever in times, and all of it's fulfilled. And then also things on into right before eternity and all of that. Literal. These are literal events that take place. The whole Bible is not just, you know, everything, yeah, there are spiritual applications, but don't miss the surface meaning. And we can build these spiritual applications by comparing Scripture with Scripture, but... There's a literal altar in heaven and it matters because your eternal fate and destiny depends upon that blood. We receive forget even forgiveness of sins that's through his blood, the Bible teaches. That's why. He was, all, he was explaining all of that because the death of the testator and the blood is required. Verse number 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Notice that. He points the significance, the importance of the blood of Christ. All these new virgins, especially, you know, the ESV, what do they do? They take out where it talks about the blood of Christ. No, the blood matters, my friends. Not just his death, that blood is a testament to my salvation and will be there all eternal, all throughout eternity. Amen. Verse number 14, it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then, so, so a couple of things real quick about that. So he doesn't have to continually go in and he doesn't go in with someone else's blood. He goes in with his own blood. Verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice to himself. Do you know what you can learn from verse number 26? That... His blood atonement applied to those all the way to the foundation of the world. But notice what it says. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. So it's saying that he doesn't go in, you know, once every year like the priest did. It's saying that he offered himself one time for the sins of the whole world. And, and it, but if, let's say, that he had to repeatedly die for our sins then that would mean that he would have to repeatedly offer himself and go into the tabernacle repeatedly. From the foundation of the world, that means. So what is implied as far as who his blood atonement uh, um, is, is uh, covering or saving? Everybody all the way to the foundation of the world. Or that would make no sense. What's implied is that he's dying for those from the foundation of the world. And if it was required for him to go in more than once, then he would have had to have continually went in for those from the foundation of the world. And it, cl it clarifies that right here. It says, but now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So notice that what happened was he came in once in the end of the world. It says, hath appeared, he, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He put away sin. He completely paid for every sin that anyone has ever committed. He put it away. That's what that means. By the sacrifice of himself. Not the blood of others. By himself. Verse 27. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this... The judgment. Verse number 27, if, you want, if, you, if somebody believes in reincarnation, throw, show them Hebrews 9, 27. It says, And as it is appointed unto man once to die... We don't die and then we're reincarnated, come back to life as an animal, reincarnated and come back to life as another person. You know, we're reincarnated and come back to life. You know, uh, all the uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, they te teach this garbage. It's not biblical. Amen. You know, if you ever hear anybody saying that and, you know, they, maybe they claim to be a Christian or whatever, explain to them, that's not biblical. That comes from Hinduism. That's, that's a serious deal. It's wicked to try to, te to mix, you know, to claim Christianity and then to mix these false teachings with it. That's terrible, Right? You know, we die once and then, you know, afterwards there's a judgment, right? It's saying that there's one death and one judgment for that life that you live. There's only one life, right? Uh, and then it says in verse 28, So Christ, so in the same way, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That's a great verse. So notice it says, so Christ was once offered. This is a summary, again, of what we just said. So he was only offered one time, not numerous times. Not like those bull, the blood of bulls and of goats. That's because that, that uh, um, offering was not, you know, uh, it was not effective. You know, there was no efficacy there. It was, not, it was not effective. It didn't do anything. It had no power, right? 
So he was, he was all offered one time because he put away the sins in the one death. He didn't need to die again. Right? This all ties in also with Hebrews chapter 6 where it said it would be an open shame if he had to die another, a second time. You'd put him to an open shame. It'd be like a, the blood of bulls and goats having to keep sacrificing him, right? So it says, So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That's referring to, of course, Christ coming. When he comes back, he's going to be without sin. When he died... When he was on this earth in his earthly life, of course he resurrected and walked the earth again for 40 days. But when he died, he had the sins of the world upon him. Right. Think about that. The end of his earthly life, he had the whole, all the sins of the world upon him. And he died at that moment. But when he comes back the second time, he's going to be without sin unto salvation. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Hebrews chapter number 9. We thank you for this church. We ask you that you'd be with this church. And you'd be with uh, everyone uh, and all their problems and everything that's going on and just bring about unity in our church and, and all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and, and we ask you that you'd uh, uh, be with uh, uh, Mrs. Ashley and with her infirmities, dear Lord God, and, and uh, give her peace during this time. Uh, we love you so much and uh, we just ask you that, that we would live lives that are more pleasing in your sight more and more each day. And we'd be more... Like your precious son, more day, more and more each day. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.